Welcome to the AUC Author Series. In this series of interviews, we highlight the creative and academic works of our Atlanta University Center members. Our guest today is Ms. Felicia Love, instructor at Spelman College. Ms. Love will be talking about her book, Brave Leap to Freedom, Integrating Mind, Body, and Spirit to Cultivate Healthy Relationships. I'm Jordan Moore, reference librarian here at Woodruff Library, and I'm joined by Felicia Love, faculty member at Spelman and author of Brave Leap to Freedom, Integrating Mind, Body, and Spirit to Cultivate Healthy Relationships. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. How would you describe Brave Leap to Freedom? Uh, it is a journey, and it's a journey in which I find that not only I've gone through, but people that I've talked to uh, over the years have gone through similar um, crises and challenges, and in that have found an opportunity to really discover who they really are. And so that's what it's really about. The Brave Leap to Freedom is taking a challenge and using it as an opportunity to really know who you are authentically so that you don't repeat those same patterns in your life. And what caused you to, to write about that? Um, well, I have a few challenges. <laughs> I had a few challenges in my relationships. And, and this is very interesting because as I started doing research and, and really interviewing um, some people, I discovered that, my goodness, when we're talking about relationships, it's really all one. It's the same thing. Um, it's the same level of respect that you're looking for. It's the same level of um, understanding that you're looking for that will cultivate a healthy relationship. So having said that, I didn't find that in my relationships. <laughs> so um, in my search of being very distraught um, and depressed in some, some um, facets of my life, um, I really went through a deep uh, journey of self-discovery. And I had to peel apart. I read everything I could get my hands on. I went to every conference I could find. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to peel apart within myself what was missing because I couldn't articulate. I just knew mm -hmm. I was miserable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's one reason why I said to you off camera, it's been a uh, eat, love, pray journey. I mean, mm -hmm. I lived, breathed, and mm -hmm. ate this book <laughs> um, over 11 years it mm -hmm. took me to write. Through mm -hmm. two divorces and several career changes. And um, at the end of the day, I understood that that brave leap that I needed to, mm -hmm. to take was to take a look at myself to see why things mm -hmm. were happening to me in the mm -hmm. way that they were. Yeah, and inside the book, uh, when you want to illustrate a point, sometimes you'll use fictional scenarios. You'll um, give fictional characters or archetypes in order to, to make a point they're trying to come across. But other times, you include parts of your own life and your experiences. So what was that decision process? How did you decide what you were going to incorporate in the book? Well... I wanted to, my background is as a broadcaster, mm -hmm. so I lived parallel lives between becoming a fitness pro and broadcasting, mm -hmm. so I talk to a lot of people, uh -huh. I have an opportunity to talk to lots of people, and I'll, I have to say that um, even when I worked at nights on mm -hmm. radio, people love to call the hotline and spill their guts. Mm -hmm. And so I had an opportunity to incorporate not things from word to word, because at that time, of course, I wasn't writing the book, but remembering people's journeys. And um, I used the archetypal um, structure from Carl Jung mm -hmm. and paralleled it with my journey. And I came up with fictional characters to kind of give the reader an opportunity to see whether or not they were living mm -hmm. that archetypal life. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we're all living different. We have different masks. We're mm -hmm. not the same person as we are at work right. or at home or among friends when you're in a safe space. Um, so the archetypal uh, structure gives you an opportunity to mirror yourself mm -hmm. and see, hmm, did I play this role in that circumstance? So, yeah, that's the reason for that. Yeah, and oftentimes, um, when even when uh, people can 
see a scenario play out. They recognize, if it's other people, they can recognize a crisis or they can recognize something that's not exactly right. But oftentimes, if it's our own experience, there, there are some blinders. So what is a way to overcome that and to have a better understanding of a crisis or a relationship, even if it's our own? I love that, and, and that's one reason why I decided to put these little vignettes, mm -hmm. little snippets in the book so that people would not be just reading about my journey. Mm -hmm. They would perhaps see a glimpse of themselves in mm -hmm. one of these characters. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, my saving grace was to, to find a name for mm -hmm. what I was going through. Mm -hmm. Um, and Carl Jung archetypal structure gave me that opportunity. Um, for me, the victim role stood out. Mm -hmm. I recognized I did not want to recognize this. Let me tell you, I fought this tooth and nail because I look at myself as a very strong, independent woman mm -hmm. who, you know, has goals and has never been defined by their relationship. Right. But the other side of me was absolutely playing the victim role, mm -hmm. and I would suppose, I, I suppose mirror that part of me to others, including with jobs. There were mm -hmm. some jobs that I was up for, didn't get an opportunity to have because I played small, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize I was doing that until I started really studying this. Mm -hmm. And in the book, a lot of the relationships and scenarios that you play out uh, illustrate something that's that's unique to women, the idea of all the emotional labor yeah. that is put upon women in relationships, friendships, workplaces, the idea that we are expected to take on the emotional health of any relationship. And it's underappreciated, but very, very taxing. Absolutely. So what are some what are some of the effects that that can have on women, and what do women and society at large do, do about that? You know, I, I love that question. I see it every day. I see it every day. I see it among um, people that I have worked with over the years. I see it with both participants, students, uh, participants and um, volunteers, you know, with my workshops. It's, it's on your face. Mm. It's, I equate the emotional strain and stress that we have to depleting one's energy mm. or spirit. Right. And we know that when we don't feel our vibrant self. Mm -hmm. When we are in environments that don't lift us up and nurture mm -hmm. us and empower us, it too takes away bits right. and pieces of our energy and or spirit. And I think women in general um, have a very difficult time as nurturers. Mm -hmm. Not all women are nurturers. And, and actually some men are nurturers as mm -hmm. well by, by, um, you know, uh, by makeup. But um, when you're a nurturer, you're, you tend to try to take care of everything and everyone mm -hmm. around you. Right. And so you're taking extra energy mm -hmm. to make sure control, keyword is control, mm -hmm. everything around you. Mm -hmm. But then when you realize, my goodness, I don't have enough energy to exercise right. or think about what is healthy to eat or mm -hmm. how I look when I walk out mm -hmm. of the door in the morning or whether or not the, the clothes that I'm wearing are lifting me up and empowering me. Mm -hmm. Because I've been taking care of everything and everyone right. else from the time I get up in the morning until I go to yeah. sleep at night. And this book speaks to giving yourself permission to take care of yourself. Right. Notice what empowers you. Find your passion again. Yeah. And it's difficult to know what your passion is when you're giving it away to everybody. I, when I do workshops, it's very interesting. I'll ask the question, what is your passion? What's your dharma? Mm -hmm. And I explain that to be the one thing that you, one talent and gift that you have been born with, mm -hmm. but perhaps people have said, oh, well, that's not good enough to mm -hmm. make a living, so you know that can't be it. Think of something else. When we pile 
all of that negative energy on top of who we really are, mm -hmm. the undoing is just as hard. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's just as hard. Mm -hmm. So when I ask people, what's your passion? A lot of people really don't know. And these are professionals. Mm. These are people who have got it all going on. The money in the bank, the career, the car, the family if they want it, world travelers and have no clue as to who they really are, what really makes them tick. Mm -hmm. Something that really stood out to me, and you addressed that fact that oftentimes people are so concerned about others and giving to others that it's difficult to take care of yourself and you, and you kind of give a reverse of the golden rule that we should treat ourselves as well as we treat others. Yes. So what are some of the barriers to that? Why, why is it sometimes harder to show yourself the same kindness that you give to others? You feel like we have to be supermen and superwomen. Mm -hmm. um, it's that, that goal to be liked, to mm -hmm. be loved, to be accepted, and we value that much more than we do uh, ourselves mm -hmm. and what we're really wanting and needing. Mm -hmm. um, in the fitness industry, I have done personal training for many years, and I stopped at one point because I found myself repeating myself over and over again, and I thought, you know, this is not working. Mm -hmm. This is not working. What I have found is that it doesn't matter whether I give you the perfect fitness plan or the perfect life mm -hmm. or the perfect bank account. If you don't really value that inside, mm -hmm. you will only have it for a short period of time and you'll lose it. Mm -hmm. And that will sadden you too because you won't be able to figure out why, why did that happen? Mm -hmm. I had it right in the palm of my hand. But what I'm asking people to do is take a brave leap to find out exactly what you value and mm -hmm. don't allow that to be overpowered by family, by career, by society, society, mm -hmm. and that's a tall task, right. you know, because there are a lot of people in our careers who just, you know, hey, we finally made it with that title, whatever that title mm -hmm. is, and we want to keep it, we want to rock the boat, right. and really say that we are creative beings, mm -hmm. or really say that we would love to express ourselves differently. Yeah. yeah. And um, in the book, you, you also... Um, give importance to things that a person has, their assets, where you, you say, um, in order to stand in your power, you need to focus more on the things that you love than the things that you don't. And do you feel that, um, that there is too much focus out there on the things that need to be fixed and changed and that rather than the things that a person has going for them? Right. If we, if we really sit down and think about what we truly love, I think we would come down to the bare bones of love, acceptance, appreciation, mm -hmm. and, and a platform to create. Mm. Um, but then that gets washed out by needing to have a certain amount of money for a mortgage, mm -hmm. um, a car note, and suffering through um, workplace um, environments that are not conducive to you know, nurturing your true self. Mm -hmm. And so we sell ourselves out. We don't realize that, but we sell ourselves out. Mm -hmm. um, I had a job once where I loved the job, but it was a very toxic work environment. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple of anxiety attacks, mm -hmm. which I'd never had in my entire life. Um, so I thought it was a heart attack. Right. <laughs> I was like, what's really going on? Once my doctor gave me, she pres prescribed Xanax. Okay. And I went home that day and I said, there is no way I am taking a medication to stay on the job. Right. So that's where, you know, the rubber meets the road. It's mm -hmm. like, do I, what do I do? There's no right or wrong. I'm not judging anyone. But for me, that was, that was my stopping point to mm -hmm. say, what do you value? Right. What is it that you truly love? How... How, had, how can you reclaim your power? Right. Because obviously you've lost it. <laughs> yeah, and um, the, a major part of the book is fi finding what you need in your mind, in your body, in your spirit to, in order to make those healthy. 
what does one do, like for um, the example you gave, when some of those things are in competition with each other? You want a certain job, mm -hmm. but it is so taxing on your mind that it becomes compromised. And something that always happens to me, I know that I'm going to feel better after I exercise. I know it's good for me, but I am just too tired. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that I kept hearing in personal training, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, so the bottom line is we have to find out what we truly value. If the job or the family um, or the social life becomes uh, conflicted with what mm -hmm. we really want, we have to stop mm -hmm. and say, okay, I'm giving too much of my power away to A, B, or C. Uh -huh. I'm going to have to take some time for myself. So that could look like decreasing hours in your workplace mm -hmm. or um, to spend more time with family. And it is a juggling act. There is no quick fix. It Once you fix it, this is irritating, so I need to tell everybody, once you fix it, it will get shuffled all over again. You have to start all over again. But the beautiful tool is to stay connected to yourself, stay, mm -hmm. stay connected to the source of who you really are. You mm -hmm. can always put those pieces back together again mm -hmm. and feel um, vibrant and alive and mm -hmm. happy and content mm -hmm. until it's time to approach the next step. So it's really just drawing back mm -hmm. and taking some time. Um, we can't necessarily lose our families or mm -hmm. lose our job or lose the friends that we have because we're so intertwined in them but and they serve us to some degree mm -hmm. but there is none of that if there's no you mm -hmm. at one point in the book you say the worst time to try to teach someone how to communicate is when he or she is in court mm -hmm. and so it's the idea that you can't learn things in the moment of a crisis that's not the best time so, what, is, what are some of the um, parts of groundwork that people can do to strengthen themselves physically, emotionally, spiritually, in order that those tools can help them through a crisis? Oh, well, uh, you are so right. When you're in flight or flight mode, or mm -hmm. freeze, flight, flight, or freeze mode, um, it's very difficult to think. Mm -hmm. um, it's everything that you can do to wake up in the morning and start the day mm -hmm. with you know, a shower and putting on clothes, much less what's to come next. And when we have that kind of anxiety, for me, I found the best thing is to honor how I'm feeling, mm -hmm. to stop and honor how I'm feeling. If, uh, if you're in flux, just all over the place, um, you can't think clearly, allow that to come to your mind. Mm -hmm. Own it. Um, the worst thing that we can do is to push it down mm -hmm. below the surface because that's what makes us explode. Mm -hmm. That's what you know unravels us to the core. But if we can honor the fact, okay, this is very challenging mm -hmm. and I feel like X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. I'm mind. My mind's not clear. I, I forgot my keys you know, or put them in the refrigerator for that matter. Um, I forgot to pick up a child from work. I did a horrible job on a presentation, mm -hmm. you know, at the office. That's mine. Body, I haven't eaten. I'm eating maybe one meal a day mm -hmm. um, because I'm, and, and when I do, it's while I'm working. Mm -hmm. We used to call it work lunches. Cut it out. <laughs> Cut it out. But you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking care of myself. I'm not drinking any water. I don't remember if I've taken any vitamins or not. Mm -hmm. So you're becoming conscious of those things that you need in order to get grounded mm -hmm. spiritually. For me, spirit has nothing to do with relation, uh, uh, religion. Spirit, for me, are those things that enlighten your senses mm -hmm. or stimulate your senses. Mm -hmm. So... Um, maybe I haven't worn my favorite perfume that, that you know brings me joy every day mm -hmm. because I've just been in such crisis I don't mm -hmm. remember or I haven't listened to music in a while I haven't stopped to mm -hmm. um, meditate mm -hmm. so when you stop 
in that moment to take assessment of mm -hmm. what's going on in that crisis, you yourself will come up with the answers that you need mm -hmm. to get grounded. Yeah. And uh, is it your opinion that if someone does those baseline things, they make sure that you know they're they are eating, drinking properly, that they are practicing self care, that in a moment of a crisis, they're they're better equipped to to handle yes. that. Absolutely, but that's the one thing. That's the first thing that goes mm. when you're in a crisis situation. That is the first thing that goes. You uh -huh. forget everything that you need to stay grounded, mm. um, and we just need to stop, give ourselves a moment with all of the chaos going around, mm. and take <laughs> take an assessment uh -huh. as to what's going on in mind, body, and spirit. Mm. And when you get really quiet, I do it in meditation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to force myself to sit down in meditation because it may just be that, you know, critical um, point that mm -hmm. I'm at at the moment. But I know that that's my only answer. If I don't sit down and listen, mm -hmm. then it just gets worse. It'll just snowball. Nothing will get better because right. you're not grounded. Mm -hmm. Yes. So exercise, I tell students all the time, um, even if you, especially during finals and midterms, oh my goodness, they come to yoga class completely stressed out. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, instead of grabbing snacks, meditate. If you're in a um, situation where you're not thinking clearly mm -hmm. or, or you find yourself with a lot of negative self-talk, mm -hmm. then stop and meditate. Listen to what you're saying so you can mm -hmm. reprogram it through your meditation. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for us adults. We just forget. We, we're so busy trying to be adults. We forget how to play. We forget how to love life. We forget right. how to honor each other. We forget about compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's everything, structure and policy. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's stressing everybody out. And, and, and the news is saying that to us loudly. And I hope, I hope um, people in administrative positions are mm -hmm. listening that you have to take care of your human capital. Right. You have to. Um, there's, you know, if you let someone go mm -hmm. um, in, in a job environment, it would behoove you to, to tap in with that person and see how mm -hmm. they're doing. Uh, you know, make nice in some way. If there's an apology that needs to be said, somebody needs to give it. Because mm -hmm. these people are taking that negative energy home mm -hmm. with them and brewing, mm -hmm. not knowing what to do with that energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, it puts us in very vulnerable situations in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, think that there is a uh, trend toward a more humanized workplace? What, uh, in the perfect world, what would you like to see the workplace's role in maintaining wellness? Um, pay attention to the fact that that is a key component to to keep that company or institution alive. Mm -hmm. um, the people who are making the policies and, and decisions have to be in that space mm -hmm. of wellness so that they can be aware of what's needed for themselves and around them. Mm -hmm. And those people who are you know, in the workforce would have to take that same stance mm -hmm. of knowing that wellness is the key component. So if I come to, in the perfect world, my employer to say, I'm becoming really stressed out. Mm -hmm. It's not, oh, well, you'll be okay. Just, you know, go have lunch and then come back for another mm -hmm. 12 hours because we really have this project to mm -hmm. do. You know, uh, in the perfect world, it would be, how much time can you give me on this project? Mm -hmm. If I allow you to go home and um, rejuvenate, would mm -hmm. that be enough space for you? to reset your mind mm -hmm. and, you know, get you to the point where you're more productive. Mm -hmm. I think this is what we're overlooking. We're piling on um, work and objectives and mm -hmm. duties, but we're not realizing how taxing that is mm -hmm. on an individual, stress-wise, coupled with their real life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> coupled with their real life. So in the perfect world, in the workforce, there would be more compassion. Yeah. And mo moving to the, the real life, um, you spend a lot of times talking about interpersonal relationships. And uh, you talk about an unfortunate thing that can happen, a sort of ripple effect, where 
Um, if something in the mind, body, and spirit, if something uh, negative happens to one aspect of them, it can throw off the others. And also, um, there is a ripple effect from past relationships influencing um, future ones, and also generationally, that a parent's past um, crises and trauma can have effects on the child. So, what are what are ways to to break up and to stop that ripple effect? Um, first and foremost, knowing what kind of life you're really living. If you are living your truth or if you are living a truth that was imposed upon you mm -hmm. by someone else's idea or value, mm -hmm. or some el someone else's fear for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's hard to know until you get into those tight situations, crisis, challenges, mm -hmm. that um, remind you this is not your authentic self, that's why this is not feeling so nice. So what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. You know, that I think, you know, as much as we don't like the, the negative stuff, it really gives you an opportunity to find out what you really want, mm -hmm. what you will really take, and what your values really are, aside from those that have been um, instilled in you mm -hmm. for you know, so long. And that has to do with society as well as our families and mm -hmm. you know whatever um, cultural structures we find ourselves mm -hmm. in. Um, and it's going to be different for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, and that's one reason why I tried to give a lot of scenarios mm -hmm. in the book um, because this is not, while it's a self-help book, it's not a cure-all. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be on your own journey, but it mm -hmm. certainly will uh, offer a little light in, mm -hmm. you know, in your situation. Yeah, and one of the um, more serious situations you talk about and something that is unfortunately um, prevalent in a lot of situations is domestic abuse. Yes. And you talk about how while some society recognizes and tries to combat mm -hmm. the physical uh, damages of domestic abuse that oftentimes other side effects, um, psychological damage, financial damage, those go unnoticed. So again, talking about a perfect world, what are some of the things that you would like to see in society to combat um, any of the damages that, that sufferers of domestic abuse face? Um, I think we have to get out of the mindset that um, if something bad happens um, to a woman, um, it's something that she's done. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be the major thing, to, to value human life more and not look at whose fault it is. Mm -hmm. Let's instead look at... Um, what we can do to create healthier environments and mm -hmm. healthier lifestyles. Um, I know that uh, college campuses have the same, unfortunately, the same issue mm -hmm. with um, violence, um, sexual violence mm -hmm. on campuses. And I sit in a lot of those uh, meetings mm -hmm. and I'm finding that same thing over and over again, even with some of the domestic violence meetings that I sat in years ago, mm -hmm. that women don't want to talk about it because they feel like it's their fault. Mm -hmm. And they feel like even if they came out and um, discussed it, that someone would either judge them or not believe them. Mm -hmm. So until we create a safe space for people to to be honest with what happened mm -hmm. and not judge them, I think we're, we're going to still see that cycle continue. Mm -hmm. On the other side of it is those people who feel empowered by hurting others. Mm -hmm. And those tend to be the ones that are dancing in fear and rejection, and they impose that feeling of power and control over another mm -hmm. by abusing them in some way, either sexually or emotionally. Um, emotional abuse is huge, and even in, in the workplace, they go mm -hmm. hand in hand. So when I talk about domestic, domestic violence, I immediately think about all violence, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is physical, emotional, financial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it all takes the same amount of stress and energy away from another. So again, in the perfect world, there would be more compassion. And mm -hmm. I think in that, in the seat of that compassion, we would come up with some um, 
plans mm -hmm. and policies that mm -hmm. speak to wellness as opposed to, you know, the judicial right or wrong mm -hmm. uh, kind of way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. Or do you think that comes from the, I the idea that so much attention in an instance of um, either domestic abuse or even sexual violence is so focused on who's at fault? Yeah. Because, I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, someone wants somebody to go to jail mm -hmm. and someone wants somebody to pay for what they've done. Mm -hmm. I get that. But we also have to figure out what, what happened in this person's life to make them feel like it's okay. And we've got a lot of things in our society that send us green lights that, you know, these negative um, approaches are okay mm -hmm. and they are not. And I think if we were to start, even in elementary school, um, talking more about communication and talking more about sexuality and talking more about um, being able to uh, debate mm -hmm. is a huge thing. You know, just having a debate club is great, but it's not going to serve you, you know, serve the masses. And I think. Mm -hmm. If we pay attention to that and grow that concept throughout high school and even college, please mm -hmm. don't forget it in college because they forget. Yeah. I'm here to tell you they forget. <laughs> um, and so they need those same kinds of um, pillars of support mm -hmm. to fall back on. Uh, so when they hear music or they see movies or whatever the case may be, you know, that's giving them the green light to mm -hmm. say, okay, I'm going to act out in this way, mm -hmm. um, there's a foundation to fall back on, mm -hmm. you know? What is one piece of advice that you would want someone to know if they are in an abusive relationship? Mm, yes. For me, that was major. Um, I lived those relationships uh, on several occasions and did not know what was going on. Um, I think it's important to understand the difference between a healthy relationship and a, and a toxic relationship, mm -hmm. first and foremost. And that will give you a guideline um, that, that'll give you an opportunity to rethink some of the things that may have happened to perpetuate that um, action toward mm -hmm. you. And a lot of times we have the opportunity to stop it, mm -hmm. but we don't know to stop it because the thing that's in our mind is to love. We want, we want to be appreciated, we want to be understood, we mm -hmm. want to be loved, we want to be blah, 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 right? And so if that is the goal, then the way you treat me doesn't matter mm -hmm. because my goal is to get you to like me or to get you to love me. And I think now we have an opportunity to pay attention to what a healthy relationship looks like mm -hmm. and know that, my goodness, when I am in this person's presence, I'm not feeling empowered and uplifted mm -hmm. and, and nurtured and safe. What's going on? Yeah. It and seems to just say, hey, that's not healthy. Or, you know, ask people. It seems like one needs to know what healthy is yes, in exactly. order to recognize things that are not. Absolutely. And uh, sadly, it took me 11 years to kind of figure that out. Um, but <laughs> cliff notes that I like to share with my yoga students because we focus on yoga teaches us um, non-resistance and non-violence in word, action, and deed. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I give them every semester, no matter what I'm teaching actually, not just yoga, but some of the other disciplines that I've taught, um, I give them the power and control wheel. Mm -hmm. And I ask how many people have seen this. And there may be one or two people to raise their hand in each class. Um, and then I give them an uh, equality wheel. Mm -hmm. And we discuss it. I usually just give 20 minutes for a discussion. I have not been able to continue my class without um, addressing everything that they have on their mind, which usually takes a class period, sometimes two. Because then they're looking at it. They're looking mm -hmm. at the emotional, emotional abuse, the sexual abuse, the financial abuse, and, and, and saying to themselves, oh, well, I didn't know if someone were to pull on my 
jacket mm -hmm. or take my phone and throw it down, that that was a signal of abuse. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. And that's mm -hmm. one reason why I give them the power control wheel mm -hmm. so that they're ever in that situation or know someone mm -hmm. that's mimicking those behaviors, they will understand, okay, this is toxic and this is healthy, so I need to either embrace that behavior and shut down the fact that I'm, I'm needing to be liked so badly mm -hmm. that I'm ne neglecting myself, or I need to just give this person this flyer and let them figure it out themselves. Mm -hmm. And what is something that you would like people to know if they just want to help combat domestic abuse at large? What are actions that, that society in general can take? Wow. Got a minute? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that there are things that need uh, to be incorporated in, um, in our classes, in, in existing mm -hmm. classes. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we certainly have to address things like um, fair negotiation, how to communicate with a person. If I, we have two different views and we love mm -hmm. each other, you know, we don't have to act out mm -hmm. our displeasure. We could actually sit down and have a conversation, mm -hmm. you know, and there may be some yelling or screaming, but the neat thing is that the person who is yelling and screaming would realize this is not serving me or the other person. Mm. It is spewing toxicity all mm. over the place. Let me back up, take a minute, and come back. That's healthy. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that, you know, it, everything's going to be Disney. It's not. Mm -hmm. I would love it to be, but mm -hmm. it's not. But if we were to at least have the tools mm -hmm. to know what is toxic, mm -hmm. I think that will give us a platform, a, an avenue yeah. to discover more healthy scenarios and environments and, and ways of being. We have to talk about what's toxic, mm -hmm. and even at a, at a young age. Yeah, and, and the reverse side of that, you were talking about the idea that there, there are toxic relationships, but there are also healthy conflicts, yes. that it isn't one or the other. Absolutely. We just need to recognize the toxic relationships. Even, for instance, if you can imagine a, a supervisor coming in who, you know, is on fire mentally because mm -hmm. somebody has them on fire and mm -hmm. they project that on you, whatever fears or anger or anxieties that they have, they project it on their, you know, um, um, employer uh, employees mm -hmm. and that same energy carries through mm -hmm. throughout from the meeting to the end of the product mm -hmm. you know so what would serve us better is to just take note of how we are communicating and what kind of energy we're mm -hmm. projecting to another mm -hmm. what does the power and control wheel look like well it is a model that uh, the Duluth corporation put together for um, women primarily who were experiencing domestic violence. And it is a picture of a wheel and it has sections and in the middle is just the words power and control. So on the wheel it just gives you a visual of the different categories that one can experience um, domestic violence. Mm -hmm. The first time that I was introduced to the power control wheel was during a counseling session mm -hmm. when I was trying to figure out what was going on with me. Um, and um, my counselor gave me the wheel and asked me to highlight everything that I felt that I was going through. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I was a little taken aback because I was like, power control, what is that about? So I started reading each, each section and it speaks to like intimidation, um, um, economic abuse, mm -hmm. um, sexual abuse, coercion, things like that. And I started highlighting, and my wheel got lighter and more and more yellow, mm -hmm. and I got a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Then he took it away, and he gave me another sheet and asked me, what um, role did I feel I was playing uh, when I am communicating with another? Mm -hmm. And so then you highlight those things, and I, mm -hmm. that's when it clicked, mm -hmm. that I had a role in what was going on with me. Mm -hmm. 
that was major. And that's the kind of information that I'm hoping to share in Bravely to Freedom. Um, the power and control wheel you can Google. Um, I have my students Google it. it they, there are so also um, organizations that have put out uh, power and control wheels conducive to teenagers, which I think is wonderful because it speaks to um, excessive texting. Um, because now your phone is your personal space. And I tell my daughter all the time, you do not have to, have to answer every single tweet or text message. Right. It consumes your life. So that's another way of abuse if a person can't get you, you know, on the phone or, or personally. Yeah. And on the other hand, what are some elements of the equality wheel? The equality wheel speaks to um, fair negotiation. Mm -hmm. it, it speaks to um, um, showing compassion. Mm -hmm. It also speaks to self-care, mm -hmm. so many of the things that um, I'm talking about in the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that this book was a, a multi-year process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that include um, multiple years of writing as well? Yes. The book it started out as a personal journal, mm -hmm. a woe is me kind of thing. And um, as I grew and continued to research and work on myself, I realized, mm -hmm. let me talk about the part that I play in it. Let me mm -hmm. find myself in all of this. Mm -hmm. And it really took a brave leap to say that I could have a part in this process mm -hmm. of healing or staying in a toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. I had a choice. Mm -hmm. So my choice is to heal. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably the reason why it took me so long to write, because I, I lived it. And I tell my students all the time, I won't ask you to do anything I haven't done or cannot do now. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the writing process um, helped you with the sense of naming something and also owning it? Absolutely. You said it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Being able to name that there is a difference between power and control. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between healthy and wellness. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between self-care and living in a toxic environment. Mm -hmm. Having those names gave me the freedom to make things better. And finally, we want to know what's coming up in the future. Uh, do you have any projects happening now? I do. I do. I have lived parallel lives all my life, so why stop now? <laughs> um, by day, I'm a yoga instructor at Spelman. Mm -hmm. Um, I teach beginning yoga and intermediate yoga. Those classes are really popular. They, you know, by the time enrollment opens that same day, the classes are full, so it's really cool. Um, but I am working on a TV show mm -hmm. that will air in Atlanta, Cincinnati, Los Angeles, and Seattle. I'm very excited on Comcast. Mm -hmm. And it's called My Spirit Fitness TV. And I interview people. I try to bring in each 30 minutes um, insight on how to cultivate a healthy lifestyle in mind, body, and spirit. Excellent. Felicia, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for watching. Thank you. It's a pleasure.